very good friend of mine, an amazing human being, and fun. I guarantee you, the next 30 minutes, you're going you're gonna to probably have a couple laughs for sure. You definitely get some stuff you can use in your life and be on a journey that's awesome with our guest, Jessica Pettit. And hey. Jessica, yes, hi, Jessica. And Jessica has a lot of cool things she's doing, so I don't want to try to sum it all up in one thing. I'm going to let you do that, Jessica. So if you could let all of our listeners know a little bit about yourself as we get rolling here on this episode of Gift of Respect. Sure. So I currently am a speaker, consultant, entertainer kind of person. I'm primarily in the college market, although I do, I'm starting to dabble a little bit more in uh, corporate worlds, realizing that they're just college students with jobs. But I used to work as a college administrator for about 10 years, working primarily with diversity, social justice, and LGBT issues. And what I've done is, um, after leaving those positions, I've kind of formulated it into my own I am social justice. And I travel around the country and do workshops and keynotes and all kinds of great stuff. So what better way to like create your own life? It's great. Awesome. And for everybody listening, it's IamSocialJustice.com. Uh, you can go right there. You'll find Jessica's work. She does amazing work. And you do it with a unique voice. You, you're, you really let your personality come through. A lot of people don't do that. You know, that the content tends to drive and their personality doesn't come through. And you have both. You've got content, you've got personality, you've got the whole package. Uh, can you give, a, for everybody watching right now, a little perspective, Jessica, on what, what is your unique angle that you share with the world? What's the unique perspective you bring to the table with colleges, universities, whether it's staff, faculty, or students? Sure, great question. So what I try to do is be what I didn't have when I worked on a campus or when I was a student on a campus. And what I think is particularly interesting about conversations around inclusion or privilege or oppression is that when someone like me or someone who looks like me shows up, there's this kind of stereotype of this angry lesbian who's going to come and like shove diversity information down your throats. And I never found that very appealing. And I don't really know how to be that person. And so I, when I started doing this work, part of the appeal is, one, I'm not angry. Um, two, I used to be a stand-up comic in New York. And so I think that that kind of brings this credibility of I'm able to be funny inside of really difficult topics. And because I used to be one of them, right? I used to be a student. I used to be an RA, an orientation leader, or a student affairs professional, a hall director. Um, I used to work in a multicultural center or was a director of an LGBT center, campus activities. So I bring, like, the ability to be an outsider who's also an insider to talk about really, really difficult topics, but everyone is included in the conversation. And one of the best things I've ever heard that I just, I honor this so much, and when we're talking about respect, is that they laughed so hard they didn't realize they were learning. Oh, and I think awesome. that's, that's, that's what I do. So. Yeah, that's a great line. I love that quote. And what's cool is it's a real testimony. It's not like some slogan you came up with. Yeah. Somebody told no, no, no. me that actually happened, which is wonderful. And you mentioned that they expect to be angry lesbians. And I, and I can imagine some individuals watching right now go, but Jessica, there's a reason I'm angry, and yep. that needs to be heard. And so for the, for the person who's out there saying, I am angry, and we need more angry voices speaking out, what do you say to that? What's your reaction? I think that's awesome. And there are a lot of people who are very angry, and rightly so, and there's a lot of people who come from that kind of place. I don't know how to do that. And I think that what I'm interested in, and I don't think it's a judgment call of that it's more important or something like that. It's just what I'm able to do is uh, I think that the anger sometimes can get targeted to certain people who then feel completely left out of the conversation. And so what I try to do is have these conversations with people who are generally left out. So like if I was angry and um, vigil vigilant, right, then I would have a harder time talking to people who are different than me. So when I come out of training, it's usually the heterosexual, Christian, conservative men, white men, 
who come up to me afterwards and they're like, this is the first time I've ever been invited to have this conversation. Like, thank you for including me instead of targeting me. And I don't necessarily think people's anger always targets these super dominant identities, but I do think people with those dominant identities feel targeted. And so I try to kind of go that route. And there's not a lot of other people doing that. So um, it's job security, and it's more fun for me. So that's what I do. And for, for everybody listening, let's really dive into the topic. What are the what are the specific areas you're going to share? Like, in other words, what are topics that you see or issues or real problems that students' challenges that students are facing in their everyday life, and how do you help? Let's take one topic at a time. What's something that you can help everybody watching right now with that specific challenge or bias or discriminatory behavior or societal right. cultural issue? Sure. And what I think is what what I really love about where my work has kind of landed is that it's not like here's the one thing to do about racism. Here's the one thing to do about uh, homophobia. Here's the one thing to do about classism. Here's the one thing to do about xenophobia. What, what I realized is is that no matter what campus I'm on, where I am in the country, if I'm working with middle schoolers or I'm working with high-level VP, admin level, what it really boils down to is that most people do not feel that they are good enough to do something. And so my regardless of the topic, I am good enough and doing what I can with what I have. And if you can approach these difficult conversations with that, it's one, more authentic, and two, it's not about waiting until you've read every book or seen every movie or have a friend collection, like one of every identity. When you do that, what ends up happening is we create, us dominant privileged folks create this kind of story that at some point we will arrive at good enough to start making a difference. But unfortunately, you're actually living your life in the meantime while you're waiting. And so what I try to do is like, maybe I come in to talk about in response to a bias incident that happened on campus. Or maybe I come in to talk about something that's kind of new to a discussion um, like transgender inclusion. When at the base of these conversations it is, you are good enough as you are to start right, doing... Can I pause something. real quick, Jessica? I just want to, sure. if it's okay, I want to pause because you're going into some great stuff. We're talking on a theoretical basis so far. So I'm going to ask us to dive in. Let's imagine that, that the example you were about to go into, the transgender, and you're saying, I'm not good enough. For some people watching, they might be wondering, who are you referring to who thinks they're not good enough? So in other right. words, the person's coming to you and saying, what's the situation they're in that makes somebody think, I'm not good enough to do what? To speak out against what wrong is occurring to me? Uh, to feel to good about out, myself? To intercept, to be an ally, to actually change something. To, to uh, We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to have measurable change. And sometimes you don't get measurable change, but you still need to be doing something. Um, we also get really scared about what is that something because we don't want to we don't want to try something and we don't want to fail but so we just don't try so like when when we talk specifically about being an ally like usually that term comes up when talking about a student a staff member or a colleague a family member who's coming out so they don't identify as heterosexual so they're coming out as gay lesbian bisexual possibly as transgender but it's the same skill set as when someone has to come out as I'm homeless Right? There's a lot of stuff in the news right now about students who are homeless and are still going to school. There's also stories out there of teachers who are homeless who haven't been able to tell their colleagues. Or I worked with a school about a month ago and the principal was going through chemotherapy and the school was going through a really hard time and so they were keeping it under wraps that they were going through chemotherapy. So I use the term coming out in a really broad way. But what ends up happening is that the person who is being come out to, if that makes sense, I don't think that's correct yeah, grammar. Yes, that's but, right. yeah. but like person A has chosen you to be the person that they're going to come out to what, with whatever, whatever it is that's currently unknown. So person B sometimes knows and is like, oh, okay, I know what to do with this. Or sometimes isn't surprised by the information 
And sometimes it's like, I don't even know what that means. What? What? Like, I need to def- hold on. I have to Google that. And so what ends up happening in those three instances, in my opinion, is that person A, the coming outer, trusts you. And person B may feel inadequate or not trained enough or not good enough or insufficient in some way, and it doesn't matter because person A chose you. You might be the best they got. And for some of us, we feel like that's really inadequate, but they chose you. And so if we can have the conversation about social justice or diversity work around working with where we currently are and how we currently are, then I think we can have a little bit more confidence to have these difficult conversations. Oh, and we see this all the time because, as you know, in our work, we teach people to help survivors come forward, survivors of sexual assault. And most people think, well, if they come forward, what am I going to do? You know, you'll have, like, high schools that think, well, we're not going to bring this because survivors might come forward. Did you just hear what you just said? They, they could come forward, that could help, but they're afraid they won't know what to do. And right. it's just amazing by just giving people the, the verbiage, the exact mm-hmm. sentence to say to somebody when they come forward to you, how much that makes people feel like, oh, I can do this. It was just They just needed one or two sentences to make them realize, I can handle that. Like you're right. saying, I'm good enough. I'm good Absolutely. enough to handle it. Give me yeah. the skill set. I'll use it. My definition of an ally isn't someone who knows everything. But my definition of an ally is someone who can listen and make educated referrals. Well, most of us can do that. You know, and when we really start talking about big picture social justice stuff, sexualized violence, the environment, recycling, racism, homophobia, all of these things are actually interconnected. And if we treat them like silos, then, you know, it's for... (laughs) I don't, it's job security, right? Because you're going to have eight speakers who have a job that year. Woo, we can pay our mortgages. But at the base of all of those things is us individually feeling incompetent and the fear of causing more harm. So on a lot of campuses or in organizations, they don't ask the questions because they're scared of the answers. But we need to be less worried about making a mistake or even a litigious culture that we live in and really authentically care about people. I mean, ultimately, that's what respect is about, is being able to actually own and respect the fact that someone just chose to tell me this information or the reverse is that I respect you enough to ask the question. I respect you enough to leave space for you to volunteer information to me and I'm going to listen to it as a gift and then I'm going to make a referral. I mean, I don't know everything. I, I don't. I know very little. I, I always joke that I have a very limited skill set, but I'm really good at my limited skill set. But it doesn't matter if people choose to talk to me about all kinds of things. I, out of respect and obligation to them, listen and respect their story. Yeah, the word value. You know, how how do you somebody feel valued when they're in your presence? Yeah. And, and how do you give value to people when they're in your presence? Are you, are you looking them in the eye? Are you When they're talking, are you truly engaged in listening in their eyes? And this is a struggle right now. As you know, a lot of people are saying, well, somebody looks down on their phone and you know starts doing this while they're talking to them. Uh, and these are skill sets we have to teach. A simple thing like look somebody in the eye. They're sharing with you. They're opening their heart. Let your heart be open back, and that's through the eyes. Uh, right. You know, those powerful little lessons that we teach. What are you finding are some of the biggest struggles that communities and campuses are having in teaching these skills? Well, I think that they sound too woo-woo is the term that I like to use. You know, that um, part of systems of oppression, one of my favorite quotes is by Francis Kendall, and that is that every system is exquisitely designed to produce the results it gets. So what has happened is we've created a system where we need to have a measurable extra system in place with, you know, rubrics and learning outcomes and committees and meetings so that we can have subcommittees to have more meetings to figure out how to not have this conversation. (laughs) When really, we could just start having the conversation. Even if it sucks and even if it's terrible and we stumble around, it's authentic and it's real. I'll, get, I'll give you the, the phrase that I bet you hear all the time. We hear it in our line of work all the time. And, and it's the phrase they use to not have the conversation. Ready? Mm-hmm. Is it 
evidence-based. Right. Because nothing can be evidence-based until somebody's been having it for a long enough time, the conversation, to be trackable, researchable. Yeah. What's the problem with that? Well, by the time it's been existing for that long for somebody to research it, the culture has changed. A new generation is here, and we need to have new conversations. But right. evidence-based makes us have the old conversation, because yeah. that's the only one that has evidence. The, the example I always use is uh, highway construction. So no matter where you are in the world, something is under construction. And it's under construction because of population data that's like a decade old. So when they finish some new construction, it immediately goes under construction again because it's not big enough or it's not fast enough because the people using the infrastructure has changed. One of the smartest things that I've ever seen happen, and it kind of goes with the same metaphor, and I think it's totally about social justice. But back in the 1900s, when I was in college, we had a new <laughs> library built. So like the corner field now had this big, big, giant library on it. And it was beautiful and gorgeous. And I went to college in Arkansas, and it rains a lot. So the students, we would all have to walk to the library, and there were no sidewalks put in. None. So the library just sits off in the corner, and we had to slug through like a muddy field to get to the library. And there was a beautiful library with really cheap flooring. And we were all like, what is going on? This is so stupid. Like, you spent all this money on a library, and now it's all muddy, and it's gross, and we have to walk, and dumb. So six months later, the construction company came back and put sidewalks in where we had carved the sidewalks. <laughs> so, like, instead of them looking beautiful from, like, an aerial view... They put in sidewalks where we were actually walking because of all the different buildings connecting to the library. They, they left it open to listen. And there was really, really cheap flooring because they knew it would be really muddy. So over one of the breaks, they came in and they replaced all the flooring, and now it's beautiful, there's no mud. Like They listened to us because they knew we were going to use the building. And what ends up happening when we start talking about systems of oppression is we're like, well, how do we dismantle systems of oppression? And you can't dismantle it with the owner's tools. And there's all these really amazing quotes. But what I think actually really dismantles the system is listening. And is an actual, real conversation between a real human being and a real human being, no matter how scary or incompetent that might feel. That's how we make change. Uh, it's so powerful, I mean, because you probably run into it as similar as we do in the field of sexual assault and sexual violence issues, which is this this notion that uh, about having that conversation. Uh, and so people will say things like, "Well, how do you know what's really going on out there? Well, you know, how can you prove that this is taking place?" Well, here's how: the students in my audience are telling me they're living this, and if they're living it. It is true to them. It is the culture they are living in. I don't need research to prove to me if my audience says, hey, we're all going through this. We are struggling with this. What research do I need? That's your campus, your students who are telling me, all I've got to do is listen, what their right. struggles are. And if and I'm listening, we can address them if I'm listening. Now, if I'm coming in right. with a preconceived notion, I'm not really listening. I'm going to tell you how that's really not an issue. You're perceiving it the wrong way. Right. If you come in with a preconceived issue, you're listening for things that prove you right. That's not listening. Um, I think, and, you know, going back to the library metaphor, it's possible one of the architects said, see, I knew we were going to have to put a sidewalk in there. <laughs> but, like, who cares? It's right. You know, like, yes, that's where we actually walked. But what I, what I think is important, and, and I would say the next step is, and, and this applies to your work as well, is around responsibility and self-awareness, right? So, like, I can't make anybody else do anything else. And I, sometimes I have parents push back and they tell me, like, oh, no, I have total control of my kids. And I was like, give me a break. <laughs> Think back to when you were a kid. You found a loophole in your parents' rules somewhere, right? So I can't yeah, make anybody... Yeah, I'm a parent of four teenagers. There's no such thing as control over your children. You have right, good job. potentially. So if, if I can't make other people do anything... I am 100% responsible for my relationship with other people, and I think that helps me listen better. But then I am 100% responsible for what I consciously and unconsciously do. And so that's part of the reason I wrote those reflection journals, notice notes, is that it gives you a space to like observe how you would react 
So then you can go backwards and see the patterns of your reactions. So listening is one piece, but the other piece is also really understanding how you show up and what are your patterns. And that's my, my comeback to like, well, is this evidence-based? Is like, yeah, I do this all the time. You know, right. when I talk about <laughs> microaggressions in curriculum writing, well, is that really a big deal? Yeah, actually, because in the last curriculum I wrote, I did it like 10 times. They can't argue with it because it's my experience. That's right. So that, that's self-awareness. And, and you mentioned the notes. So if you could tell everybody out there, what are, what are the, uh, the notes that you have available for people to be, be able to use in their own lives? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the my book is called Notice Notes, and there's actually three editions to it. They're available on Amazon. Um, you can also get them on my website. Um, if you go, the overarching website is jessicapettit.com. Um, but Notice We're Notes has... because Pettit has two T's twice. Oh, yeah, yeah, seven letters. Four of them are T's, promise. So um, yeah. that's why I switched it to I Am Social Justice, because no one can spell my name right. So good point. So Notice Notes has, there's three editions of them, and so the first one is 52 different observations from my own life. So I live in airports, so a lot of them are in airports, things like this, but they're things I noticed where power was at play. Sometimes I'm the dominant person, sometimes I'm the subordinated identity, sometimes I'm the marginalized person, sometimes I'm just observing a situation. So there are 52 of them. And then what I noticed was is people started dismissing some of the scenarios because they happened to me. So I wrote two and three solely from current events. So I think that we have to distance ourselves a little bit from current events to be able to like kind of newly react. So I backed up. And so it's from 2009 up to the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. And those current events, there's 52 of them again, the second and the third edition. And the idea is, is for you to have either one a week. So, like, let's say you supervise RAs. Like, you could spend the first five minutes of your RA meeting reviewing that week's prompt. And for those and, listening, RAs would be resident assistants on a university oh, right. campus. Right, good job. Or if you supervise other people, or you can do it one-on-one, -on -one, Mike and I could do it. Or it was originally designed for me to do it by myself, like, when I woke up in the morning. So the idea is, is to be able to respond in writing how you would respond. So sometimes you're like, I don't even see this. I don't get it. But eventually you'll notice there's a pattern where you can't see the power at play, and it's usually because it's a dominant identity of yours. Then when you do have reactions, you'll notice some patterns where you'll respond in a, what I call a heady way, where you start asking a lot of questions and you need information. And then some of them you'll have a pattern of a hearty response, which is much more of like an emotional reaction or inaction, like emotional paralysis. And you're just, you're so overwhelmed you don't even know what to do. But then the third one is action-oriented, and that can also be inaction-based, where you like leap into like a protest or a petition signing or you do something like this. What ends up happening is that you can actually notice your reactions, the patterns of your reactions, they usually come in your first and second choice. So I tend to be a very heady person, and then occasionally will get a hearty response. But what's more likely is that I have a heady response that immediately leads to action. And that's just kind of how I react to things. And then every once in a while, when I have a hearty response, it really becomes like a crucible moment in my life. Like, significantly changes how I view things. So by having that level of self-awareness, you then can begin to notice your own patterns and how you respond to power and privilege. And that's your responsibility. And what matters to you, right? Because you, right. you can tell the difference by which way it's coming at you. And so once again, they can get the books on Amazon. And how would they, it's, it's Notice Notes? Notice Notes, one, two, and three. Notice Notes. Yep. Jessica Pettit, that's P-E-T-T-I-T-T. So everybody, make sure they look up JessicaPettit.com. You can get it there, too. And you can bring Jessica to speak, and she rocks, as you can see her energy and the fun that we're having here today. Yes, uh, and so that's JessicaPettit.com. Thank you, Jessica, for joining us on Gift of Respect this week. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And my parting words would be to everyone, listen with your heart and ask questions where you need to. Like, just ask. Awesome. It's okay. Thank you so much, Mike.
Oh, no, that's awesome advice to wrap up with, so thank you. For everybody listening, remember that Jessica and I are now about to film the show called Impact, which is really turning back, pulling back the curtains, and Jessica's going to share how she's gotten where she is today, what that journey was like, what it continues to look like today, so you can see how she's making an impact in the world. This show, Gift of Respect, is every Thursday, 10.30, I'm sorry, 10 a.m., uh, Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, every Thursday. We look forward to you joining us again next Thursday. Have an awesome day.